Okay, welcome back guys. Today we're going to be talking about mitochondria and the chloroplast. So in the last video, we talked a lot about the nucleus. So let's get into some of these other organelles. So mitochondria and chloroplasts, of course, are going to be organelles that we find chloroplasts in the plant cell, mitochondria in both. Okay, so I think probably we're pretty aware of mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell, Okay, so this is going to be where we get our energy from cellular respiration, most of the energy. And then our chloroplasts are going to be plant cells. These are going to be our photosynthetic organelles. So these are going to help us grab that energy from the sun and convert it ultimately into a form of chemical energy. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at our mitochondria in more detail. Okay, so you can see that there are a lot of interesting attributes. Okay, so of course, first thing you notice, probably this outer membrane, which you can see here also in our microscopy, and this inner membrane. Okay, between the two is what's referred to as the intermembrane space. This is a very general sounding name for a space with a very specific purpose. So when we start talking about cellular respiration in chapter nine, we're gonna hang out a lot in this intermembrane space. So making sure that we understand that that's there. This is critical for the function of our mitochondria. Okay. We also may notice that while the outer membrane is relatively smooth, the inner membrane has a lot of folded in areas known collectively as cristae. Okay, so you can see what these really look like in the microscopy. Okay, so these are very real, and the function of these is to help us have more surface area. So when you see things like this, really getting back to that structure function concept of surface area. And the reason for that, again, we'll learn more about it in chapter nine, is that all of these inner membranes are completely embedded with the stuff that we're gonna need for cellular respiration. Specifically, we're going to be really looking at a lot of that machinery that's involved in the electron transport chain. Okay, so we know our glycolysis is going to happen in the cytosol, citric acid cycle in the interior, and then the electron transport chain really connected to this enfolding these cristae. Okay, so now that we're kind of in the center, this is referred to as the matrix. So again, processes like the citric acid cycle will go down here. But you may also notice that they have a lot of free ribosomes, okay? So they have only free ribosomes because they don't have organelles, okay? So we've just got free ribosomes. And it's worth noting that these ribosomes, while they function very, very similarly to our cytoplasmic ribosomes, they're actually a little bit distinct. So if you had to, you could tell the difference between these and our cytosolic ribosomes. Okay, that'll come into play in a minute. So we know more about our mitochondria, its function, generating that high ATP payoff that we need to power all of our daily goings on in the cell. Okay, so be really comfortable with the structure of this guy so that ultimately when we do get to chapter nine, we're ready to jump into a lot more in-depth function. Okay, it's also worth repeating that plant cells definitively also have mitochondria. I think sometimes people kind of get this idea that plant cells have chloroplasts instead of mitochondria, but that's not true. They simply have both, okay? So they have both organelles. So that brings us to our chloroplasts, okay? And you can see some attributes that we've got going on here. We definitely have that double membrane this outer membrane and this inner membrane. You can see that our inner membrane is not gonna have these infoldings like our mitochondria did, but we still are gonna need a lot of surface area to do these photosynthetic reactions that we're gonna be responsible for. But instead of folding in the inner membrane, we get the surface area by producing these little disks of hollow membrane. So sort of like a flattened bubble. They're hollow on the inside, but pressed kind of flat. This is what's gonna give us that membrane surface area that we need. So again, we're gonna find out in chapter 10 how 
really important these membrane bound enzymes and processes are going to be. So we've got our surface area and these membrane bound stacks individually we refer to these as thylakoids. Okay, so we've got thylakoids, all right, and internal inside this we're going to have what's referred to as the thylakoid space. That's not labeled here, but I'll mention it now, and when we get back to chapter 10, we'll learn a lot more about it. Collectively, these thylakoids are stacked like pancakes to form what are called grana, individually a grana. So these grana stacks, again, are gonna give us the surface area that we need, okay? So again, we've got grana stacks, we've got our inner membrane and our outer membrane, and then also in the stroma, this internal sort of business, we have ribosomes, okay? And again, these are functionally identical, but they're gonna be a little bit distinct from the cytoplasmic ribosomes that plant cells have. Okay, so that's gonna tell us some interesting things about this a little bit later. So again, we know our chloroplast, its main function is to help harness the energy from the sun to drive this sort of carbon fixation that we're ultimately gonna to wanna to achieve. So these light reactions, dark reactions, we're gonna be really looking for those to proceed here. Okay, so they're the other half to our mitochondria. It's worth mentioning, I think, even though we won't spend a lot of time talking about it later on, that there are actually a lot of other organelles that are derived from sort of the same origins as chloroplasts, okay? So we call these plastid organelles. They may start out sort of chloroplasty, or they may start out with some similar origins and then sort of be repurposed for these different uh, kinds of ideas. So amyloplasts, these are gonna sequester starch within the cell. So I bet you can probably think of a lot of times, a lot of reasons a plant would wanna sequester starch. We're also going to have things like chromoplasts. So this is gonna hold the pigment in fruit and flowers. Okay, and this is really important for um, a plant's fitness. Having colored flowers, it looks nice to us, but the purpose of flowers is really reproduction. So that's really the site of reproduction for our plants, which we know is so important to fitness. And we have to be able to attract pollinators so that we're able to successfully go to seed and spread those seeds around, okay? Similarly with fruit, we want to disperse our seed. That's kind of the idea. Also, tanosomes. These were discovered somewhat recently, like in the 2000s. And these are responsible for the production of a compound called tannins that are sort of, again, put into repurposed chloroplasts. So these chloroplasts, they have thylakoids, and we're gonna kind of upcycle these thylakoids to basically hold stacks of tannins. Okay, and I don't have a slide about tannins now, but this is, these guys don't taste good. So these are kind of, I like to think about in wine. Okay, this is, you know, can make the flavor a little bit off. It can also um, be a little bit bitter. So these, I think, are kind of a defense mechanism for plants that we just ignore because we're still gonna, you know, partake of them. Okay, so what do mitochondria and chloroplasts have in common? Okay, they both contain their own ribosomes distinct from the rest of the cell. They both have a double membrane. Okay, so that's interesting. They both contain their own DNA. So we didn't quite talk about that, but they actually all have their own circular DNA. Okay, worth noting that it's circular because that should remind you of something, okay? They also replicate independently from the cell. So what can all of these things that they have in common tell us about their origins? All right, well, we'll find out more about this in the next video.